Hello, everybody. This is Lecture 7. Um, it follows the book's title, Homosexuality, but you can see that I'm going to be focusing here um, at the end of this lecture on discrimination, particularly marriage. I'll give you some insights into that. We'll talk about the historical aspects of homosexual orientations, and we'll start out with terms. Uh, you know, the reality is, for one, this will be a little bit longer than normal. My apologies. So get some popcorn, get a drink, do what you need to do. But when you venture into the specific, um, let's say the specific uh, uh, research of a particular professor, they were, they, we, I will tend to go a little long on this, but I, hopefully this will be some insight. What I'm going to try to do is augment what's in the book. There are some good things in there and some things I think that were absent. And there are some things I do believe that need to be focused on a little bit more intently. Okay. So anyway, when we are talking here about um, homosexuality, I wish we couldn't start there. I wish that we could start just talk by talking about human sexuality in general. And when I do normally teach that, courses on that, homosexuality is a very small component of that, which keeps it in perspective. Um, this, you know, it, it, some people that are homosexual, same sex orientation, you know, could be and should be offended by somebody simply just, you know, talking about um, homosexuality some deviation compared to everything else, um, other sexual um, proclivities. And I understand that, um, but nonetheless, this is the task before us here. The reality is this, is that, you know, even though I'm a heterosexual, it's not a primary element of my identity. Now, I understand that because of past discrimination and um, the protection of certain dignities and rights that uh, a homosexual person would have that a little bit closer to the fore. And the reality is, is that we all identify with aspects of our um, being that are not central. So, you know, if a person's Puerto Rican and they appreciate that heritage, they have pride in that, as I do in my Italian background. Um, a person might also do so with a particular race. Uh, but these things are not the, the foundation of who we are as beings, right? So there, there are commonalities that we all share regardless of race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. So let's just keep that in perspective as we move along. Uh, okay, the other reality is this. Uh, they should have, if we're going to start with terms, they, they really should have started talking about what is sex. Sex is a biological determination and it's male or female. Okay, and it's not something that you change. Now, before you know, you start thinking that somehow this is going to be offensive, uh, we're going to differ differentiate between sex and gender. We're going to talk about those things briefly. But sex, and, and this is not, you know, a religious argument by any means. Uh, if you go to the World Health Organization's website, they're very clear that when we're talking about sex, uh, male or female, XX, you know, for female, XY for male, we are talking about 46 chromosomes and 23 pairs. And that is the normal classification for the um, biological designations of male and female. Are there variations on that? Yes. But let's be very clear that those variations are abnormalities and they do not create distinct um, sexes. So if you read somewhere in popular um, articles and such, you know that there's now five or six sexes, but you need to be very clear on that. Um, philosophy, you know, especially when you start bringing logic to bear on this, it, it's, it's very dependent on the term. And if you start to wiggle the term a little bit, you really could bring up much more than five or six different sexes. For instance, besides the XX and the XY, you have Turner syndrome, you have XXX females, you have XXY males, you have Klinefelter syndrome. These are uh, derivations. They do not constitute separate sexes, all right? So um, we're going to have to just leave that to the side. Are there intersex uh, individuals? In other words, they have some uh, development, per perhaps even mature, um, you know, uterus, undeveloped uterus and uh, testes, yes. And what happens and what do individuals do with, by individuals, I mean doctors and parents, with a child that is born with um, this abnormality, you know, that's debatable. And that's not something we're going to solve here. But the reality is, is because that's so central, like you've ever heard the phrase, you know, the exception proves the rule because of it's so difficult to work through that, you know, we're going to have to understand that our males our maleness and our femaleness is, is, is more central to our beings and our orientation. Okay, so we're going to try to just, in our, at least in our mind, separate um, those understandings that male and female 
um, have to do with sex and gender. Again, according to the World Health Organization, this could be a, a social construct and probably is. The reality is gender is masculine and feminine. So we all know uh, males who are more feminine and females who are more masculine. So they may share those traits that are typically aligned with one particular gender or not. We're not getting into some stereotype as to what distinguishes male or female. Um, that's another long argument. It's a very good one to have, but it's another uh, long one. Um, you know, but we also can't just pretend that um, all those attributes that we would designate male or female are constructs. We'd have to almost dismiss the fact that if, if we're going to consider a woman more um, nurturing, uh, even evolutionary speaking, does that have nothing to do with the fact that she bears children and has a womb and such? I would like to think that she would have the upper hand on that type of nurturing. And we also can't um, dismiss the fact that these hormones that we share, uh, testosterone and estrogen, uh, depending on their levels on our bodies, have, have no effect on our particular expressions in this gender. So can a person, you know, change or, you know, fall along the spectrum of gender? Absolutely. Um, but you, when we talk about a, a sexual reorientation, let's you know, say it this way, a sex, uh, if somebody's going to have what we would normally call in the popular culture, uh, a, a sex change operation, that's cosmetic. And th there's nothing offensive about that. You, you can change the person's genitalia. You could put them on hormone therapy uh, to orient them one way or another. Um, and they will bring up the secondary characteristics. Um, a woman that's taking testosterone, you know, will develop facial hair, um, hair in other parts of the body, a lower tone in their voice. Okay, but this is all being um, maintained artificially, if you want to say, through the injections of um, those hormones. So you cannot technically change a person's sex. Um, now, I, I know that that probably sounds controversial to some, and perhaps this would take a longer conversation. But it's important for us to know there's a difference in the term between sex and between gender. And this has nothing to do with any religious convictions of any person. Um, again, go to the World Health Organization's website and they'll um, lay that out for you. Okay, um, let's talk real quick and briefly about the history of homosexuality. So it's probably fair to say that there's always been people who are attracted um, to the same sex throughout history. There's no reason why a person would say otherwise. As far as referring to it as a particular orientation, even the book was very clear that that's a 19th century phenomenon. And, and it started, and it was not started, the orientation was designated between two males. Uh, the term that's used exclusively between female and female orientation, lesbianism, came about a little bit later. So prior to that, um, doesn't mean that there were not people who were not attracted to same sex. It's just that the understanding that it was a, a permanent and fixed orientation is something uh, new for us. Now, you, you will, if you study this, and, and there's, there's no way we can, in fact, I'm probably going to be going on a limb just talking about it because I'm not gonna be able to do it justice. But somebody will refer back to say, well, in ancient Greece, uh, we understand that homosexuality was quite normal. Well, yes and no. Um, there's, it's hard to say exactly how we can understand what they would understand as homosexuality as we would. Oftentimes, um, th there were relations. I mean, you can go back to even some creation uh, myths that talk about male, male, and female, female. Um, but one thing that I think the book did mention, and I'll use different terms than they use, was what was known as the standard of pederastry. This was where you had a, a married male uh, who was in a relationship it was basically uh, pedantic in, real, in nature. In other words, it was a teaching, like almost like a pupil tutor um, relationship. And this individual, this boy was known as a Peus, and he would be between the ages of 12 and 17. And he would be taken under the wing. In other words, this was totally consensual. Now you might say, well, how can a 12 or 13 year old consent to such a thing? Because this was sexual too, right? I mean, but it was known to be virtuous. Let me say it this way is that in, in marriage in the ancient time uh, was primarily for the procreation of children. Um, the, this element that we understand as of love now, which let me just, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of asides here. This is something else that complicates the discussion on sexuality, is that our modern notion of falling in love, dating the person that we are romantically involved with and then marrying them is quite novel. You can look that up and you'll come to the same conclusion that we're basically talking in the last 
150 years or so. Uh, most marriages were either arranged or they were at least approved um, by the, um, the male of the household, be it the father or the brother. You know, regardless of how sexist that is in, in our current state, this was how they understood it. So um, the chances of me and my wife, uh, even though we're from the same economic background, the chances of us um, being married today would be you know, slim. Uh, my grandparents from Italy were part of an arranged marriage. Um, they learned to love each other and they had plenty of kids, you know, they had 14 children. But nonetheless, um, so, you know, today when we talk about homosexual relations and such, you know, we're always talking about romantic love. And that's an element that's new for both heterosexuals and homosexuals, persons, okay? So just keep in the back of your mind that, you know, we're in a new paradigm. And we haven't quite found a way to, to discuss this in the framework of our own culture because most people grow up in a generation as we did, and this is how we've always known it, we sort of assume that it's always been like that, but it hasn't been. So the connection between romantic love and um, being in a marriage is new, okay? Just keep that in the back of your head. So back to ancient Greece, this understanding that you know marriage between a man and a woman was utilitarian. In other words, it was meant for procreation. So the, the man who never considered himself a homosexual orientation would have a relationship with a young boy between 12 and 17, the paeus. This was known as ephibic love. And he would tutor this child, but he would also have sexual relations with this child. And again, back to the consent, the parents of the child would find it to be an honor if this was a man of high stature and he could um, basically help um, our child in tutoring and make connections for his life. The difference here is, is that, um, first of all, the wife knew this. This wasn't like something done outside or secret from their marriage. But once that young boy reached age of 17, that relationship had to stop because um, it was... It was seen, it was deemed immoral by their standards for uh, an emancipated male, say 18 or older, to be effeminate um, or to be in a passive position. So you can, you know, imagine that, you know, in, even in the sexual, the physical sexual role, there was a dominant and passive position that was taken. And it was, um, if you want to say, uh, allowed in their culture for a young boy to do that, but it was not thought to be uh, proper for a man. So that doesn't discount that there weren't relations uh, above that, but there were laws through Greece and Rome. Uh, the ancient Jews were the, were the most adamant against, adamant against it, uh, but we just have to be careful. And I'm not trying to build the whole history for you, but we have to be careful that we take what happened 2,000 years ago and import it into our culture today and say that somehow you know, we are simply repressive. Um, we're not always comparing apples for apples. So keep that in the back of your heads, all right? Well, let's see here. Okay. Now, in the contemporary debate that we're in, we often get bogged down into the causes. You know, why is a person gay? Now, is that important? Um, I don't think it is in the end, but let's at least talk about it. So one of the arguments is that if a person is born that way, I mean, here we are slogans again, right? So just like pro-life and pro-choice, there's nothing wrong with the slogan. The fallacy is when a slogan is accepted as an argument. So when somebody it says like the song "Born That Way," it's implying that you know you should allow somebody to express the um, sexual orientation that they feel they were born with. Um, that in itself is is not going to really hold up, and we're going to see that it really may not matter in the end. I do not discount when somebody tells me if that has a same sex attraction that they have always felt that way. Um, I don't recall any time in my life where I was not attracted to females at the moment. The earliest I can remember that there was some sort of sexual attraction was always towards females. So why would I discount somebody who says that um, to the same sex? Um, so, you know, we know that there's no like, you know, just definitive gay gene. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a genetic influence. So when we say there's, there's no gay gene, it, it's we have to make this, this conclusion based on the fact that they've mapped out a lot of that anyway. But the reality is, is in monosogenic, monosogenic twins, uh, where they share the same DNA, you, you would think if one were, um, had a homosexual orientation, the other one would too. But it's only a true, you know, a percentage of the time, 25, 30%. So that tells us that it, it simply cannot be solely um, based on the, the genetics, but yet there's still a genetic component to it. 
because we um, also recognize that, you know, homosexual orientations could cross generations. So how do we explain that? And that's not easy. Uh, I think in your book, let me see if it, it talked about um, possibly androgens being lower in people with homosexual orientations or the XQ28 um, chromosome. Um, but you could also read in the book about how those studies are either with animals or they're a little inconclusive. Well, there's another aspect of genetics that the book did not talk about, and it's called epigenetics. And epigenetics is when there's some uh, difference in the gene expression, right, the phenotype, but there's no change in the DNA sequence. They've studied this and other things. To be honest, like risk-taking, infidelity, um, they realize that some people have a 40% more chance for infidelity based on certain risk-taking uh, gene expressions. So there's some gene, you know, which by the way, is probably why one of the reasons at least that, you know, the fact that we are born this way is not going to be something that's accepted. There are many things that we were born with that we do not accept. Um, we almost start to fall into a naturalistic fallacy. If you remember Hume, right? The is, the ought, just because something is doesn't mean it ought to be that way. You know, well, this can be applied to this too. But nonetheless, it's still worth, ex you know, explaining because it does talk about you know, how much control a person has over their uh, sexual expression. So that being said, um, could it be that there's some genetic marker um, that uh, is affected in utero? Um, you know, the, the flooding of estrogen, um, early childhood trauma. If you study psychoanalysis, uh, you'll realize that that has an impact. So these things could either be, you know, in utero or, or post utero um, that have affected the gene expression. And that would explain how it's not, it's nurture, but it's not like the family is like raising them in, in that regard. It's things in the environment after conception that have led this, uh, this individual um, into a situation where they, yes, it, the, in, all, in all sense and in all intents and purposes, got to get that one right, you are expressing something that you've known no other way. And that's an important aspect. I think that's, you know, as we learn more about this, that's interesting. It's, you know, there's a danger there for a person who has a homosexual expression and, 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 and prefers that lifestyle, that if it is found to be some sort of abnormality, um, would they correct it um, and such? So, you know, that's a concern from the homosexual community. But it does um, place it in the category, or at least outside of the category, is it a choice or not? So, you know, if it is a choice, then we still have to find other reasons, you know, to accept or to not accept it, right? I mean, that doesn't change the, the ethical qualities that we're trying to look at. For some people, it is a choice. Um, now, this is not just anecdotal, but you know, if you're friends with people with sexual orientation as I am, I've known people who told me, for me, it is a choice for some of their, you know, this particular girl, she did for some of her sisters. Um, she knows it isn't, but for hers, it is. Um, you know, I would debate exactly, you know, how much of a choice it was when you hear the background of abuse and such. Um, it comes from a different place, but nonetheless, um, you know, this is, this is variant. And the reality is, is I don't know where this argument's going to go in the end. And I don't really know that it's going to change anything in the end. It's important for us to talk about it because some people will make the argument. If a person is born this way or that way, then that is sufficient means for a person to continue on in that. And that's not really a logical argument. Um, it's important though, to know what, uh, influence genetics has. So we keep our eyes on this as philosophers, but we also know that it's not maybe going to change things in the end, whether or not um, this is a social construct. Because, you know, in queer theory, as you read in the book, the difference is that there's always some sort of power struggle here. So these are all, you know, social constructs that have been placed on us, and they probably would go so far depending on um, who we're speaking about that even the uh, qualities of male and female. Well, they would see male and female as qualities and not something uh, determined biologically. Um, and that's not the same as an essentialist position. Again, uh, we're going to have to just leave it there. Okay, I don't want to make this longer than I have to. So let me wrap up um, with our understandings of how this affects marriage. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to be as dispassionate about this as I can. I have lectured on this so many times and you could only imagine how hard it is to have some of these conversations, as they would say, at the water cooler or in the public square. Uh, the terms aren't always accurate. Um, at least they're not symmetrical as to how we're using them. Uh, people bring a lot of emotive um, 
aspirations to the discussion and uh, it's difficult it's difficult sometimes and it often can appear again let me re let me state that a person who has a same-sex attraction how insensitive that this all um, could appear in other words why don't you bring this some sort of are the same sort of level of criticism to um, let's say heterosexual marriage um, my only response to that is you know we do and I do probably more so again if I were teaching a course on human sexuality and marriage uh, this would be such a small component of it you know so um, but I'm trying to stay with how the textbook presents something so this is why we're talking about it here so you know back in the US uh, you have to understand where we're at now you know with this over Vichel and Hodges and I know I mispronounced that but the case from 2015 to legalize um, homosexual marriage in the United States you know you go back to the Stonewall Inn incidents 1969 and you see how um, many people with a home with a homosexual orientation you know were unjustly discriminated against right and uh, this started uh, rightfully so in their minds a revolution to be recognized as human beings first um, which oftentimes they weren't we can go in a lot of the history of this and I, I know you've read a little bit about the Kinsey report and such uh, and Michelle Foucault uh, Michelle Foucault's another story Kinsey report I have some issues with that I mean his his understanding of people with homosexual orientation and how that relates to the level of pop, the people in the population it's often known as a 10 percent myth you know he he just overly used uh, people that were in prison as a population particularly those who were sexual offenders um, there was so much that was questionable about his research. Now, there's been a lot since then. So I'm not saying that the stuff that comes out now is bad. What I'm saying is that, you know, I think it said this in the text, that the Kinsey Report, when that came out, it affected popular culture much so much more so than it did science. So I'm giving you an understanding of like what was inherited. So if you, if you grew up through high school in the 70s and the 80s, you know, coming off the Stonewall Inn incident um, was in the back of your mind. Um, and uh, AIDS. Now, when I was in, well, first of all, let me go back even further. When I was in high school, uh, there's only two people that wore earrings, and those people that were involved in, in drugs or those who were in the gay community. And um, if you just research, uh, I think it was right is wrong, left is right, as to where a person wore the earring, that told you which particular group they belonged to. Um, again, there's no bearing on our, on our particular present culture but it's something that came out of the 70s and the 80s, um, as did the influence of the AIDS epidemic. So I was in college before I even heard of AIDS, um, probably like a sophomore or junior. And at the time, it was not called AIDS. Um, it was just, I know it sounds terrible, but it was known as some gay cancer. Now, the reason why is because they knew it was some autoimmune thing, but they were finding it predominantly in the gay community and also in, in those that abused drugs. So it took, a, it took a while until, probably until the 90s, until they realized, you know, there was the HIV virus and how this came. So a little guy, oh, I can't remember his name right now, Ryan White. Ryan White in 1990 had received uh, HIV and, and then full-blown AIDS through a blood transfusion. And he died at the age of 18 and put a whole new face on this, right? So... You started to see the stigma of AIDS and such uh, being attached solely to the homosexual communities to wane. Okay, then you see some um, you see some changes going on, but I can assure you that nobody in the '80s and the '90s would ever have thought by 2015 that there would have been some legalized gay marriage. We're not quite sure, you know, what would have happened back then. But the ideas for the average person in the '70s and the '80s of two males or two females kissing was like a uh, cringeworthy and I don't mean that to be offensive to anybody um, it, it was no, there was nothing in popular culture you would see nothing on TV that would ever um, you know how do you want to say uh, groomed you to you know accept that sort of expression of love um, today we live in a different age um, so young people that are growing up today again this is your world you know nothing other than this and these things I've just told you are just parts of history um, for good and bad okay Nonetheless, so with gay marriage now, we're starting to ask her, um, certain questions, right? Like, you know, her slogans come up again. In other words, you know, love is love. So it, it's saying that any two people who love each other, why is it that they can't um, express marriage? 
there's a few things, you know, philosophically you have to try to keep in mind through all of this and you have to separate and understand that it doesn't discount that notion, but how it doesn't help it as an argument per se. For instance, you know, again, how early in the history of human, I shouldn't say how early, how recently has this understanding of romantic love been an aspect of marriage, right? Um, and because two people love each other, must it be expressed sexually? So to what degree have we conflated love and sex? In other words, you know, we don't think in the terms intimacy is anything outside of being, you know, sexual involvement. So the reality is with us today, um, if we're making the expression that two people who love each other should be able to have married and have sex, those two things don't always, three things don't always go together. Um, a lot of people have sex who do not love each other. You know, this is not, you know, 17th century Massachusetts and we're not in the crucible novel. Uh, plenty of people uh, get married that may or may not have sex. Uh, plenty of people get um, married who may or may not love each other uh, to, to the degree that we think is, you know, adamant, I should say adamant, adequate um, for a relationship to be sustained. So we, we wind up into this particular situation where we start to ask questions about is marriage being exclusive to a male and a female discriminatory towards um, two males or two females? Well, in our culture now, we know that that's legally the case. I'm going to tell you up front that I don't think it's really possible um, to withstand uh, any future antagonism from other groups. And I'm leaving that vague because I want to explain something before you think that somehow I'm some traditionalist religious fanatic here. Uh, I'm going to end by uh, explaining how a, a, a really wonderful um, woman who is an LGBT advocate and atheist is going to agree with the entire argument that I'm going to present to you. Okay, so if we try to say, like, um, what was a marriage prior to um, 2015? Now, first of all, heterosexual, heterosexuals themselves has almost destroyed the institution, right? So we're just going to leave that aside. Um, people are not monogamous. Monogamous is one person for the rest of your life, not one person at a time. So we are pretty much in, in serial marriages. At least we have been, you know, for the last, you know, 50 years or so. But if we say that a marriage is between two people, that it's monogamous, that it's exclusive, uh, that it's lifelong, and that it's consensual, those are typically the elements that have been uh, part of marriage, at least in the Western tradition. Um, if we have gone and said, okay, but now we're going to allow two men or two women, um, so, you know, as opposed to a man and a woman, and we've just changed that one element. Somebody might say, well, but if you're going to think that something else is going to come of that, like say polygamy or such, isn't that just a slippery slope argument? It is, but it doesn't mean it's a fallacy. So let me explain something real quick. A slippery slope is when one thing, uh, it, it, whatever, whatever you use as a determinant, in other words, I say this is the principle that I'm applying. If I apply that in other instances, will it then allow um, leniency or change in those instances too? If the answer is yes, well, then it's a slippery slope. If the causal link is not apparent or you're attributing a different causal link, now you're in a fallacy. Let me give you a very clear example. There was a time when you walk into any restaurant or any bar and everybody smoked. And at some point, you know, the effects of secondhand smoke became uh, known as a itself, you know, not just a carcinogen, but a cause of cancer, they started to have uh, non-smoking sections in restaurants. Okay, now, there were plenty of people back then who said, look, how long until you want to allow smoking this restaurant at all? Now, was that a slippery slope? Yes. Was it a fallacy? No. What was the determining factor? The determining factor was is that there are, this is a public place, and there are people who do not smoke and do not wish to inhale secondhand smoke. So we're going to move them to a section where there is none. But the people who were smokers said, well, how long is it going to be until we're out of the restaurant entirely? Because as we all know, you know, the difference between a smoking section and a non-smoking section was sometimes a four foot high wall that doesn't really keep the smoke out. So it wasn't too long before smoking was banned. So that was a reality that came to fruition and it should have been. Now, if somebody were to say, now you're not allowing smoking in these restaurants. How long will it be until you don't allow smoking in our own homes? That is a slippery slope fallacy because you have changed the criteria. The criteria is no longer simply a public place 
based on the fact that secondhand smoke is bad for one's health, you've now moved to a private place. So it's an entirely different criteria. Okay, so that would be the fallacy. So when we start talking about marriage and we ask what was the determining factor that allowed us to go from male, male, female to male, male, or female, female. The factor was that we said anybody who um, is in a consensual loving relationship, okay? So is it a fallacy to move to other types of marriage? Bear with me here, and I'm going to read these because um, it's not, I can't keep everything in my head, right? If you go, this is studied in psychology, sociology. This is not something I'm making up, and these are not some, like, you know, um, obscure things. Nonetheless, let's say that somebody's going to go from um, having two people because can't three people love each other just as well as two people? That's polygamy. Uh, if you haven't um, seen anything in the news in the last three or four years, there are people who are just, you know, saying, why do I need another person? Uh, why isn't that I can't just simply be married to myself? It's known as polygamy. Um, or what they call starter marriages. So, in other words, um, since we don't know what our future is, and the fact that we're all living longer than most people, should we really make commitments at, you know, 20 or 30 years old? when We might live to be 80. You know, if the, if the life expectancy was, say, 60, 70 years ago, only 45, well, why can't we make a commitment, say, for 10 years? And we will just leave it at that. And then after 10 years, we'll determine whether or not to renew it. So perhaps rather than celebrating your um, 50th anniversary, you would celebrate your fifth um, renewal. Now, if that sounds odd to you, there's really no reason. If we're going to make it a contract between uh, consensual people who love each other, then that's certainly um, open to them. It, it's the same criteria, right? Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, companionship marriages. So how about if you know, they're older or if um, they simply want to share benefits? Um, and I'm talking about benefits through work or such. Could they simply say, you know, our relationship is not sexual. It's based on love, but it's not sexual. So we want to enter in this relationship. Um, that's not unheard of, okay? Uh, let me see what else. Uh, Open marriages where, you know, yes, we um, do have one person that's on the marriage license, but we have um, consensual sexual relations outside of the marriage. So that here gives something that's, that's not monogamous and it's obviously not exclusive, uh, but it's still based on the premise that we have people that are consensually in a loving relationship. Um, of course, you know, we don't know exactly why it has to be love, but we'll leave that go for, um, for now, right? So at this point, you know, these are not, these are slippery slopes, but these are not um, fallacies per se. And if they are fallacies, you're going to have to show me how each one particularly would fall underneath, underneath that. Okay, so I want to wrap this up. Um, and I'm, I hope that nothing I said is offensive. Uh, as philosophers, we, we just have to, we have to ask a lot of questions. And we have to ask, uh, where is this, if somebody were to say, you know, what difference does it make? We would say, well, back to my initial reaction is it possible for what we would consider to be marriage to be maintained? Not that it'll be anything. Where this would be a fallacy if somebody started talking about um, child marriages or if they started talking about bestiality, you know, because we, we've we left, nobody has given up the elements of cons consent, you know, or the fact that a person is able to love, you know, at least has the ability to do so. Um, so those would be slippery slope fallacies, okay? So nobody's talking about those. But these other things, I don't know. Well, I do know, and I don't. I've listened to arguments over arguments, and I, and I've never gotten the question satisfied, at least to my own thinking. So let me talk to you in the last few minutes. And again, I apologize for the length of this about Masha Gessen. Masha Gessen is is a Russian. Her last, I'll spell her last name for you, so you can look it up. It's Masha M A S H A G E S S E N. She's a Russian American journalist, an LGBT advocate, as far as I know, an atheist. And I have to tell you, anything I've read about her or anything I've heard about her has been nothing but wonderful. She just seems like just a splendid human being. Um, we would probably disagree on some things, but I think we'd have uh, great conversations if I were ever honored enough to be in a particular situation where I could have a conversation with her. She disagrees with nothing I just told you, right? So that's why I want to make sure that you understand this is not a religious argument whatsoever. Um, her situation is rather unique. As a matter of fact, you know, she has, has worked so hard, especially in Russia. As far as she knows, she was the first, you know, out person to get married um, a Russian citizenship. She says she's worked so hard for LGBT rights, she doesn't want to um, be deceptive as to what her goal is when she gets there. And her, she has flat out said that, you know, um, is her life and our understanding of her relationships 
compatible with marriage? She goes, no. She goes, I don't think that we should deceive people to say that just because, um, you know, we, in other words, as a homosexual, she goes, I don't just want what they have. I find the heterosexual concept of marriage to be incompatible with anything that's a realization of my life. Now, she doesn't speak for all homosexuals any more than I speak for all heterosexuals. But in philosophy, we don't take the origins of our positions as the um, foundations of the argument. We take the premises and the clarity of the terms and the um, validity of the argument to stand on its own, okay? So I'm gonna read to you from what she said. This is from a 2015 Vogue article, okay? And I have all this stuff if anybody ever wants links on about this. She says about marriage, she goes, it's a terrible formulaic contract. It enforces an unrealistic expectations and obligations. She goes, it obliterates my lived reality. Take our family, says she, for example. Our kids have five living parents, me and Dara, my ex, and two of their biological fathers, one of whom happens to be my brother. So she had artificial insemination by two individuals and one her then girlfriend was artificially inseminated by her brother. She goes, Daria, Daria, I, Daria and I have the primary responsibility for sheltering, feeding, clothing, and schooling them. My ex provides the teenagers with a sympathetic ear into which they can unload complaints about me and Daria. And the bio dad's role is like that of uncles. In the case of my brother, it is that of an uncle. She goes, if we were going to put our family obligations into a contract, I'd rather see one that reflects all those relationships for my kids' sake. In other words, what she's saying is that, you know, her paradigm, there, there's no way it can fit in any realm of a traditional understanding of marriage. So she thinks that it, as an institution, it needs to go away. Okay, so these are the arguments that we have. Good luck trying to get into these things civilly at the water cooler. It's very difficult. You know, we as a people have to watch it because we all have biases and we all have proclivities towards certain bents in these issues. And what happens is that we um, often speak from emotive terms and our desires, it begins with our desires and then we try to rationalize our desires and then argument afterwards. It's difficult to take this from a dispassionate point of view. And I've been doing this for so long, I could tell you that oftentimes students get very irate, even part of this discussion. Um, but we have to um, work this out in a reasonable, phil excuse me, philosophical way. We're obligated to work through the argument. So um, hopefully you um, have gained something from this lecture. Um, as I'm telling you, even arguments I agree with, and forget about you know this issue of homosexuality, even when I agree with the person, I sometimes dismantle the argument showing them how it makes no sense what you just said. Um, so the argument must be sound. And this is not the final word on anything. It's part of the discussion. It's what I didn't find the e-textbook to cover. And in my experience of doing this for the last couple of decades, um, these are the issues that normally come up. You know, what are the terms? Um, how is the history of um, sexual orientation related to our current state? And then particularly, how does this fit into our understandings of marriage? And um, what is the ethical export of that? So anyway, um, thanks so much, guys. We look forward to the discussions on these. Ciao.